he became acquainted with Rev. Roy Davis, pastor of the Missionary Baptist Church, who was a great blessing to Brother Branham in his early Christian life. One of the first things he realized was that God wanted him in the ministry and therefore would have to heal him. He went to a church that believed in anointing with oil and after prayer was healed instantly. Realizing that the disciples had something modern ministers did not have, he asked God to give him what the early disciples had. The disciples were baptized with the Holy Ghost, healed the sick, and did mighty miracles in the name of Jesus. He began to pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. About six months later, when he received the baptism, God spoke to him, telling him to preach the word and pray for the sick. After William Branham had turned to God and responded to God's call, everything seemed to go lovely for him. He was happy. He enjoyed the company of people. For the first time in his life, he felt that he was not a black sheep. He was not an outcast and that God was probably able to take this hopeless case of humanity and make something of it. Within six months after his conversion, plans were being made for his first service. He began tent meetings in his own hometown of Jeffersonville. It was estimated that as many as 3,000 people attended a single service and a large number were converted. This was unusual for even an outstanding minister, and here it was his first campaign. At the baptismal service which followed the campaign, over 130 people were baptized in water. It was at this time that the heavenly light appeared above him as he was baptizing the 17th person. This light was witnessed by the large congregation that stood on the banks of the Ohio River, and the newspaper carried an article pertaining to it. The people who had been saved in the Jeffersonville tent meeting decided to build a tabernacle, which is now known as the Branham Tabernacle. The next few years were fruitful, during which time God's blessing rested upon him. He received visions of things which would come to pass. He could not understand them at that time, but as they came to pass, he was able to see that God had given him an accurate picture. During the early years of his ministry, he met Hope Brumbeck the girl he later married. After about five months of courtship, William Branham decided that he would have to ask her if she wanted to marry him. After all, she was a nice girl, and if he was never going to marry her, he shouldn't be wasting her time. I shall narrate to you the story of his bashfulness, the proposal by letter, his marriage, and other events which followed their happy marriage, as it was told by Brother Branham in his simple yet dramatic style. I was just a little country boy and real bashful. Considering how shy I was, you probably wonder how I ever got married. I met a fine Christian girl. I thought she was wonderful. I loved this girl and wanted to marry her, but I didn't have nerve enough to ask her. She was too good a girl to waste time with me. She would get someone else, so I knew I had to ask her soon. I only made 20 cents an hour and her daddy made $500 a month. Every night I saw her, I would resolve that I was going to ask her that night. Then a great big lump would come up in my throat and I just couldn't do it. I didn't know what to do. You know what I finally did? I wrote her a letter. Well, that letter had a little more romance in it than Dear Miss. I did my very best to write a good letter, although I'm sure it was poor. So in the morning I got ready to put it in the mailbox. Then the thought occurred to me of what would happen if her mother got it. Still, I was afraid to hand it to her. Finally, I got up enough courage to put it in the mailbox on Monday morning. Wednesday night, I was supposed to meet her and take her to church. All week until Wednesday, I was really nervous. Wednesday night, I went to see her. As I went, I thought of what would happen if her mother came out and said, William Branham! I knew I could get along all right with the father but I wasn't so sure of the mother. Finally, I went to the door and called for her. She came and said, Oh, hello, Billy. Come in. I said, If you don't mind, I'll just sit on the porch. I made sure that they wouldn't get me inside. She said, All right, I'll be ready in just a few minutes. Although I had an old model T Ford, she said, It's not far to church. Let's just walk. This alarmed me, and I was sure something had happened. We went on to church, but she didn't say anything. I was so nervous that night, I didn't hear what the preacher said at all. 
You know a woman can keep you in suspense. After we left the church, we started walking down the street. It was a moonlight night. Still, she didn't say anything. At last, I decided that she hadn't gotten the letter. This made me feel better. I thought that perhaps the letter had been misplaced by the postman and soon I was my old self. We kept on walking. I looked at her when we came out from behind the trees. Her dark eyes sparkled as the moonlight shone on her. I thought, oh my, she looked like an angel. Finally, she said, Billy? I said, yes. She said, I got your letter. Oh my, I thought, Oh, oh, here it is. You're going to get it now, Bill. It's all over now. I thought she had waited till after church. She didn't say another word. Then I said, you did? She said, "Uh uh-huh. I thought, go on, hurry up. I couldn't stand it. You know how ladies are. They'll keep you in suspense. We had walked almost a city block and she hadn't said a thing. Finally, I said, Did you read it? She said, "Uh Uh-huh. I said, What did you think about it? Was it all right? She said, "Uh Uh-huh. I wished she would say something. Then I said, Did you like what was written in it? She said, "Uh Uh-huh. I said, Did you read it at all? She said, "Uh Uh-huh. Well, we got married. We finally made it. Before we did, though, we decided that we would have to ask her parents. I knew I could get along with her daddy best, so I agreed to ask him. She was to ask her mother's permission. I kept putting it off as long as I could because it made me nervous just to think of it. Finally, one evening I had said goodnight and was about to leave when Hope motioned to me and pointed to her dad. Oh my, I knew what that meant. The time had come. I could put it off no longer. So I asked him if I could talk to him out on the porch for a minute. He said, sure, Bo. When we got out on the porch, I said, it's a nice evening, isn't it, Charlie? He said, sure, Bo. Then I said, well, uh, uh. He said, yes, Bo, you can have her. I said, thank you, Charlie. Oh my, he saved me a lot of trouble. Then I said, Now look, Charlie, I can't make her a living like you do. He was one of the organizers on the Pennsylvania Railroad Brotherhood. Oh my, he made good money. And there I was, making 20 cents an hour with a pick and a shovel. But I know this one thing, I continued. I've never seen anybody in the world I love like her. I love her with all my heart. I'll promise this to you, Charlie. I'll work as long as I can work and I'll do everything I can to be true and good to her. I'll do everything I can to make her a living. He said, I'd rather you have her than anybody I know of because that's what counts, Bo. It's not money, it's how happy you are. I'm awfully glad he felt that way about it. Happiness does not consist in how much of the world's goods you own but how contented you are with the portion allotted to you. That's right. Whether you have much or whether you have little, just thank God for it. We were married, and I don't believe that there was any place on earth any happier than our little home. I remember what we had when we started housekeeping in two rooms. I bought an old stove from a junk dealer for a dollar and a half and spent 75 cents to put grates in it. A lady gave us an old folding bed. I went down to Sears and Roebuck and got one of those little breakfast sets that you have to paint yourself. It wasn't much, but friends, it was home. I would rather live in a shack and have favor with God than live in the best house there is without His favor. We did not have very much of this world's goods. I remember once I told my wife that I would have to ask the church to give me an offering to help enable us to pay our debts. Before this time, I had never taken an offering in my church. That Sunday evening, I had asked one of the elders to get his hat and take up a collection. But after I had announced what I was going to do, I saw a little old mother open her purse and take out some of her pension money. Oh my, I didn't have the heart to take her money. 
So I got up and told them I was just fooling and wondering if they would do it. Later, a member of the church gave me an old bicycle, which I painted and sold. After two years, a little boy came into our home. When he was born, that just tied us together better. When I first heard him cry in the hospital, something told me he was a boy. I said, Lord, there is your boy. I will call him Billy for his father and Paul from the Bible. His name shall be Billy Paul. The doctor came out and said, Your boy is in there. I said, Yes, his name is Billy Paul. So then we were happy. I remember we worked together. She'd work at a shirt factory trying to help us make a living. I'd preach every night. All day long I'd work in the ditches. Sometimes when I'd come home at night, my calloused hands would be frozen and often bleeding. Hope would sit and dress my hands at night before I'd go to church. Then she said she wanted me to take a vacation. She had about $12 saved up and she wanted me to go on a little fishing trip. So I said, all right, but don't you want to go fishing too? She said, no, I would rather be here for the summer Bible school. So I went up to Lake Popo in Michigan, just above Indiana, with an old minister friend. My money didn't last very long and I had to return. On my trip back, as I crossed the Mishawaka River, I saw a great number of people gathering for a meeting. Wondering what kind of meeting it was, I decided to stop. That is where I got acquainted with Pentecostal people. The people had gathered for a convention. They were singing, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Pretty soon a bishop got up and began to preach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I decided that I would stay until the following day. I didn't have money for a hotel room, so I went out in the country and parked in a cornfield where I slept that night. Next morning, I got up early and returned to the church. I had bought some rolls and milk so that my money would hold out. When I returned to the church, quite a number of people had already gathered for morning worship. That night, there were a great number of preachers sitting on the platform. The leader said, We haven't time to hear you all preach, so we are going to ask each one to just stand up and tell us your name. So when they came to me, I got up and said, Reverend William Branham, and sat down. The following afternoon, they had an old colored man get up and preach. He was rather decrepit, and I was a little surprised to see them choose such a fellow to preach before that great congregation. He preached from Job 7. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? when the morning stars sang together. Well, that old fellow picked up about 10 million years before the world was ever formed. He just about covered everything in heaven, came on down the rainbow and preached on everything on earth up until the second coming of Christ. That night, I went out to the cornfield again and slept. In the morning, since I supposed nobody knew me, I decided that I would put on an old pair of seersucker trousers. My other pair had gotten rather creased from using them as a pillow. This was the last day that I could stay as I only had enough money left to buy gas to go home. I went back to church and when I arrived, the people were singing. The minister in charge got up and said, We've just had the testimony service led by the youngest preacher here. The next youngest minister is William Branham of Jeffersonville. He said, Come up here, Reverend Branham, if you are in the building. You may be sure this startled me. I looked down and saw my seersucker trousers, so I just sat real still. In fact, I had never seen a public address system before, and I certainly didn't want to get up there and preach before all those powerful preachers. They called again. Does anyone know the whereabouts of Reverend Branham? I only crouched down in my seat lower than before. The call was repeated again. The colored man sitting beside me turned around and said, Do you know who he is? I said, Listen, I'm Reverend Branham, but I have on these seersucker trousers and I can't go up on that platform. The colored man said, These people don't care how you are dressed. They care about what's in your heart. Well, I said, Please don't say anything about it. But the colored man didn't wait any longer. He shouted out, Here he is! Here he is! My heart sank. I didn't know what to do. 
The night before out in the cornfield I had prayed, Lord, if these are the people that I have always wanted to find, that seem so happy and free, you give me favor before them. Well, the Lord gave me favor with them, but I hated to go up before the crowd in those seersucker trousers. Everyone was looking at me and I had to do something. So I went up on the platform. My face was red and as I turned around I saw the microphones and I thought to myself, what are those things? I prayed, Lord, if you ever helped anybody, help me now. I opened the Bible and my eyes fell on the verse, the rich man opened up his eyes in hell and then he cried. There were no Christians there and then he cried. There was no church there and he cried. There were no flowers there and he cried. There was no God there and he cried. As I preached, I cried. Something got a hold of me and the power of God came down upon the congregation. The service went on for about two hours. After it was over, I walked outside. A great big fellow with cowboy boots on came up and introduced himself to me. He said, I'm from Texas and I have a good church down there. How about holding a two weeks meeting for me? Another preacher from Florida came up and said, How about coming over and holding meetings for me? I got a piece of paper and took down names and addresses. And in a few minutes, I had enough revivals lined up to last me throughout the year. Well, I was happy. I jumped into my little Model T Ford and down through Indiana I went. 30 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour straight ahead and 15 miles an hour up and down. When I reached home, my wife came running out and threw her arms around me. As she looked at me, she asked, What are you so happy about? I said, I have met the happiest bunch of people I ever met in my life. They are really happy and they are not ashamed of their religion. These people had me preach up at their convention. And what's more, I have received invitations to preach at their churches. Will you go with me? She answered, Honey, I have promised to go with you anywhere until death separates us. May God bless her loyal heart. So I decided to go up and tell my mother. When I got there, I told her about the invitations. She asked, What are you going to do for money? We felt that the Lord would supply. She put her arms around me and blessed me and still prays for me. She said, Son, they used to have that kind of religion in a church I knew of years ago, and I know it's real. And friends, what I say now, let it be for your education. Let my mistakes be a lesson to you. Friends and relatives warned me against accepting what I knew was God's call to me. Some said that the people I had met at the convention were trashy people. I later found out, and I say it reverently, that what was called trash was the cream of the crop. I was told that my wife would get enough to eat one day and go without food the next. Others told me that it was my job to stay there and look after the work in Jeffersonville. My wife spoke to her mother and she said she would go to her grave with a broken heart if hope went with me. My wife cried and I told her that we must go home and talk it over. She decided she would go with me, but I said we better not. Dear friends, this is where my trouble started. I listened to what a woman had to say instead of what God had to say. Within 18 months, I lost my father, brother, sister-in-law, wife and baby, and almost my own life. I will never forget it.